So, uh, there was one last little treat I wanted us to do together. You guys, are you guys fucking ready for the little treat? I have some, uh, wild, conservative react stuff to do. We have some fun stuff. So the first one is I wanted to read an extremely, extremely funny website. Um, which is, hold on, let me just bring this up. Okay, I was t uh, tuned on to a, <laughs> a very, very interesting little, uh, little website, okay? Hold on, let me find the actual website. I have to find the link here. Um, I want to look at the original one. Okay, you know what? Fuck it. Oh, yes! Yes! This is a website called sexinchrist.com. Are you all ready? Here we go! sexinchrist.com sexuality according to the word of god so the treat is that after i told you all that we need to think about religion better we are going to make fun of extremist fundamentalist religion and what we're going to do is we're going to talk about <laughs> the many 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 articles on this incredible sex in christ website Okay, this is going to be, in my opinion, a very fun little endeavor that we get to embark on together. Okay? Should we start? What do we want to do? Oral sex and God's will? Viagra and God's will? Three th threesomes within a Christian marriage? Reader question and answers? Masturbation, God's great gift to us? A proposal for Christian pornography? Bondage in Christ? BDSM in a Christian marriage? Fisting and God's will? Barefoot before or bare before God shaving in the Bible a philosophical argument for masturbation I know which one we should do a proposal for Christian por pornography <clears throat> Many readers have written in to ask us about pornography Is it acceptable for Christians to view adult entertainment? Our stance on pornography is directly informed by our position on sex and sexuality with regard to Christianity. Depending on the circumstances, the act of intercourse can either be a defilement of the body and soul through lust and an indulgence of the senses, or it can be a celebration of God-given sexuality that uplifts the bodies and spirits of both partners. Likewise, pornography could either be degrading and sinful, as it almost always is, or it could depict acts that, when viewed appropriately, could enhance the sexual and sensual relationships of believers. Erotica with Biblical Foundations Consider the Song of Solomon, a deeply sensual and erotic book of the Bible, which describes in lyrical detail the sexual and romantic relationship between a bride and bridegroom. Their dialogue relates to spiritual matters, but relates spirituality through a loving physical relationship between husband and wife. This is the model of erotic edutainment that we are proposing. We believe that under the right circumstances and given the correct content, such adult media has the potential to enrich the sexual lives of married Christian partners. Of course, there is little, if any, adult entertainment currently on the market that reflects these values and would be a good choice for Christians. That leads us to call for a new kind of porn. Porn that upholds the Christian ethos. Christ-centered porn. Meant to be viewed by Christians and tailored to their unique needs. We challenge Christians in the adult industry, yes, they do exist and you know who you are, to step up and truly walk their walk and live their faith by producing pornography that men and women of God can view without comprising their relationship with their Savior or their relationship with their spouse. Christians have so many questions about sexuality. What is acceptable or not? How to express sexual desires to their husband or wife? How to have more fulfilling sex life? And much, much more. Unfortunately, few in the church are willing to talk openly and in detail about these matters. Most sexual guides for Christians are vague or coy, glossing over graphic details. Believers need sexual resources that are unafraid to actually demonstrate and show them what se healthy sexuality in a Christian marriage looks like. For these relations, we believe there is both a need and a demand for Christian adult entertainment, and so we are issuing this manifesto calling for a new paradigm in pornography. Here we go, everybody. Toward a framework for Christian porn. It must depict only married couples engaging in sexual acts. This means that any sexual partners in a Christian porn production must be husband and wife, both on and off screen. All actors must be married in real life and portrayed married couples on screen. They must only be depicted having sex with their wedded spouses. 
It must portray sex within the context of a Christian marriage. It must be apparent through the actions, behaviors, and speech of the characters portrayed that they are Christian, lead a Christian lifestyle, and have a marriage in which their faith is central. This could be depicted in a variety of ways, with scenes showing a couple praying together, studying the Bible, attending church or church functions, and generally relating to one another as loving Christian spouses outside of the bedroom. Oh yeah, maybe they go to church first, and then they get, and then on the way home, they're like, ooh, honey, you want to do some Christ fisting? Oh yeah, give me the Christ fist. And then the 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 lady just like, you know, the wife is just like, oh my Christian husband, my husband, I love you. And then and then the the husband's like, here it comes. And he goes, hey! and it just and then and then over the video, just see Jesus's face just fade over the fist as he punches really hard into his wife's ass. Love it. Let's continue. It must be instructional. Part of the mission of Christian pornography is to graphically educate married believers in how to achieve more sexual pleasure, intimacy, and closeness in their relationships. It can do this by dramatizing various sexual techniques and positions so that couples can learn how to incorporate them into their lovemaking routines. In their on-screen roles, the actors should model both correct sexual techniques and appropriate sexual attitudes by being respectful and treating one another's bodies as the sacred gift from God that they are. That means that the woman can never be on top, by the way. That means the woman needs to be submissive, just so you know. Just, that is that is a euphemism. The actors should model both correct sexual techniques and appropriate sexual attitudes. That's what they're talking about. Husband and, wife, uh, husband and wife must both receive their due benevolence. This is in keeping with the scripture, scriptural mandate of Corinthians 7.3, which says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise uh, uh, also the wife unto the husband. This means that both sex partners must be shown getting equal pleasure and sexual attention from one another. Well, that's uh, that's good, I guess. Very egalitarian. No extramarital sex unless it is to illustrate the downfalls of adultery. Ooh, technicality. You can show extramarital affairs. Ooh, every, ooh, we're going to have lots of downfalls of adultery. Ooh. The spouses in a Christian porn production must never have adulterous relations unless they and their partner suffer and are punished fittingly for their sins. In deference to modern conventions, the punishment does not have to be the one man, uh, mandated by God, i.e. being stoned to death. Lame oh no! Oh no! <laughs> uh oh! Oh god! Whew. Okay, I'm getting a little sweaty there. That's a little wor worrisome. It must be uplifting, inspirational, and focusing on strengthening Christian marriage and Christian faith. Christian porn must have an overall positive message. Of course, its primary message would be to demonstrate the use of sexuality and sensuality to reinforce the bonds of a Christian marriage. But in all other respects, it should affirm Christian values of community, family, faith, honesty, charity, and so forth. It should show that having a joyous and, and fulfilling married sex life is one of the fruits of following the path of righteousness. Ooh. All right. Shall we see what, ooh, let's see. Come on. Let's see what fisting in God's will is. The fist of might. I told you guys this was going to be a treat after everything. I told you. I told you all this was the treat after a long day of heavy stuff. <clears throat> fisting and God's will. The sex act called fisting is a source of confusion and misconceptions for many Christians. This is unfortunate because it means that many Christian men and women are depriving themselves of what could be the most se spiritual sexual experience of their lives. Like anal sex and BDSM, fisting is often mistakenly associated with the gay community. Oh, God damn, not the gay community. Oh, no. Or is considered a, a sex act too extreme to be appropriate for Christian couples. Not only are these views incorrect, but fisting actually has a scriptural precedent, as we will show. The fist of might. 
Over and over in the, in the scriptures, the hand and fist of God are described as a symbol of his awesome power and the means through which this power manifests. O oh God, God of our ancestors, are you not God in heaven above and ruler of all kingdoms below? You hold all power and might in your fist. Of course, the Old Testament often makes reference to God smithing his e smiting, sorry, <clears throat> smiting his enemies with his fist or striking down the wicked with his hand. But it is also the means through which he administers his blessings and benevolence to the righteous. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Uh through the, through the hand of the Lord, he guides us to do his will, touches our lives, expresses his love, and provides for our needs with his abundance. The biblical significance of the hand is important because in the act of fisting, one partner, usually male, inserts his entire hand and fist into the vagina or rectum of his partner. Rather than copulating with his penis, he penetrates her with his fist. Given the powerful symbolism of the fist, it is no surprise that couples who have partaken in the practice of fisting have described it as being a profoundly spiritual experience. On a symbolic and sexual level, a wife who is fisted by her husband has the experience of surrendering completely to the divine love and power of the Lord as embodied by her partner's hand. The husband, in turn, has the experience of touching and caressing her inwardly in such a deep and intimate manner as God touches our own souls with his grace. Well, don't ever say that Christians can't be romantics, okay? I've never heard somebody write about this in the... Hi, Yoda! Hi. This is just high effort trolling? No, I don't think so. I unironically think this is dead serious. There are... Listen, guys, 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 guys. Sexual desire is, is so powerful. Christians don't generally win. Usually what happens is like this. If somebody really wants to, like, have anal sex with their wife, they will create a ministry in which they prove definitively by the Bible that God wants them to have anal sex. That's how they, that's, that's the dementedness of hyper doctrinal Christianity. It's so literal that they'll bend themselves into mental pretzels. I guarantee you this is 100% accurate. I bet Gayfesh, Gayfesh, do you think this is legit? I bet this is legit. Both Gayfesh and I have probably, like, I've read shit like this. In actual books published by Christians, I bet Gay Fesh would agree this is this is legit. Yeah, it's one hundred percent legit. <laughs> Vor buddy says, "Fill me up with God's love by punching in my cervix." <laughs> God loves you, so put your fist in my ass. Oh yes, he loves me so much, he'll let me fist your ass. Oh, God loves you, and Jesus loves you even more. He will let you fist your wife if you ask real nice. Ah. <sighs> Go ahead, clip it, have fun. Powerful, yet gentle. In Song of Solomon, the Bible describes the act of fisting and the pr profound erotic bliss it induces. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, Open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. My love thrust his hand through the opening, and my feelings were stirred for him. Here we see the lover gently coaxing his companion to open up to him, metaphorically knocking at her door, preparing her sexually to em and emotionally to receive his hand inside of her. Gradually, he works more and more fingers into her until the moment when her vagina yields and his hand slips fully inside her, thrusting through the opening. She then describes the powerful passion that this arouses in her as she envelops his entire hand inside her body. Many couples describe this moment as the, f as the fist makes full penetration into the vaginal opening opening as a transcendent and sexual revelation. As the woman's body accommodates her husband's hand, both may experience a sense of physical, sexual, emotional, and spiritual oneness. Stop laughing! Stop! Stop laughing! There's nothing funny about this. This is serious business of God's will. Stop. Some common misconceptions about fisting are that it is very painful or somehow violent or abusive. This is far from the truth. Not always. And as we can see from the above description, it can be gentle, loving, and highly erotic act. 
Fisting does not have to be painful if it is performed correctly, using enough lubrication and patience. The hand is inserted in a slow and controlled manner and is preceded and followed by other sexual stimulation, which may even lead to orgasm. Both the vagina and the rectum are extremely elastic. A vagina, after all, can stretch to accommodate a full-term baby. And in fact, a woman who has been blessed with motherhood can more easily enjoy fisting because her vaginal opening is more flexible. That's a myth. That's a myth. The act of fisting is physically challenging to perform, requiring patience on the part of the active partner and relaxation on the part of the receiving partner. It cannot be rushed, and the two participants must communicate closely with the fister carefully observing and attending to his partner's comfort and limits, and the fistee directing her partner as to when to push forward and hold back as he works his hand into her. A Christian couple can use fisting to build trust and intimacy between them, as well as strengthening their relationship with the Lord. You heard it here, folks. Good Christians can use fisting to empower their relationship with God. Jesus loves fisting. Fisting is an act of faith. Before attempting fisting, a Christian husband and wife should pray together and ask for divine guidance. The husband should ask that God guide his hand and work through him, and for the skill and patient to fist his wife correctly and maximize her pleasure. The wife should pray, pray for openness and readiness to receive God's love and grace in the form of her husband's hand. Both should treat the act of fisting as a divine spiritual mystery to be entered into with reverence and awe, especially the husband. In another spiritual interpretation of fisting, as he inserts his hand into his wife's vagina, a man is symbolically reenacting the moment of truth following Christ's resurrection from the tomb. What? When doubting Thomas touches the wounds of, in the Savior's flesh, then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and observe my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be an unbeliever, but a believer. Okay, that's a stretch, guys. That's a fucking stretch. Even for the Christians, that's a stretch. Thomas's doubt would not be satisfied until he physically felt the wounds in Christ's body and penetrated his flesh with his hand. Likewise, the spiritual and sexual power of fisting cannot be known unless experienced physically. Role reversal. So far, we have only discussed the husband fisting his wife, but some couples may wonder if it's appropriate for a wife to fist her husband if he enjoys anal stimulation. In most cases, a wife indulging her husband's desire to receive light anal play is not problematic in the context of a healthy sexual relationship. A wife may even anally penetrate her partner with a strap on if he enjoys this, and if their respective roles as husband and wife are secure outside of the bedroom. However, because of the intense nature of the act of fisting and the degree of surrender and submission involved, a couple should first look into their own hearts and pray for guidance as to whether it is wise for a wife to fist the husband. Wow! This is... Oh, the religious mentality! Yes, it's okay for you to fist your wife, but husbands can't because that would be gay. Oh my god. I know, me too, gay fesh. Holy fuck. Oh, I, we got to Okay, we got to end it with the Christian BDSM, don't we? Oh, no. Oh, boy, here we go. By the way, what you are going to see in this article, I can tell you right now. I am. I have not read this article. I, I only read... The only one that I read before this was the porn one, and that's because it was so funny. I've not read this one. Willing to bet right now, it's going to reinforce exactly what I said back in the kink at pride thing, which is that literally marriage rings and Christian marriage is BDSM by default. Christian marriage is an act of bondage between individuals. And they always like to downplay it because there's this way of, of saying that, oh no, it's, you know, because it's normal, it's not weird. But guys... Christianity's marriage uh, marriage rituals are bondage. So anyway, just so you know, I was right then and I'm right now and you're going to see it. Bondage in Christ, BDSM in a Christian marriage. There has been an ongoing debate in the Christian community about whether or not Christians can engage in BDSM bondage and discipline, dominant, submissive slash sadomasochism practices without sinning. Although BDSM can involve literal bondage, being handcuffed or tied up, and discipline such as verbal chastisement or corporal punishment, 
It is best understood as a metaphorical relationship between a husband and wife in terms of spiritual submission. Mm, I don't agree with that. But I mean, I don't agree with anything here. Which is an important theme in the New Testament. A BDSM relationship between a dominant husband and a submissive wife is actually the ideal of marriage. Set out in Ephesians 5, 22 to 26, taken to its logical conclusion. I told you. I fucking told you. Oh, I never miss on this shit ever. I, I fucking told you. Oh, I'm going to read it again. A BDSM relationship between a dominant husband and a submissive wife is actually the ideal of marriage set out in Ephesians 5, 22 to 26, taken to its logical conclusion. Let us explain further. Spiritual submission, the ideal of marriage. This is where we're going to get into the deep cuts. Pay attention, everybody. This is where you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. Here we go. Most of us are familiar with this famous scriptural blueprint for a Christian marriage. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also the Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just also as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her in the washing of water by the word. The husband and wife who choose to enter into a consensual, dominant, submissive relationship are choosing to fully enact this commandment in their sexual life, a choice that is valid and honorable and may bring them both sexual, deep sexual and spiritual fulfillment. BDSM practiced responsibly can be a tool of growth for both, partners, for both partners in a Christian marriage as it allows them to more fully explore God's plan for spiritual and sexual partnership. Do you see? Christians literally believe that a dominant submissive relationship between a husband and wife is the ideal. The wedding ring is a mark of ownership. It is, ex it is no different than putting a collar on somebody. These are, are identical acts, and yet one is treated as perversion and one is treated as something so common that you see it every single day. Just as we trust in the Lord in our submission to him and willingly offer it, a wife who is submissive to her husband is offering a great spiritual gift and doing a service both for herself and her husband. In Christianity, submission is holy. Even Christ, the Son of God, was submissive to the Lord. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. When God says submit, he means submit completely because he has a higher purpose in mind for us. When Hagar ran away from Sarah, she was sent back by a divine messenger. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, you must go back to your mistress and submit to her and submit to her mistreatment. What appears to outsiders to be an abusive situation may in fact have been a much different meaning. In this case, Hagar needed to return to fulfill her service to the house of Abraham. By the way, Hagar was a slave. Just so you know. Hagar was a slave who was enslaved. And she ran away. And God made her go back. BDSM does not necessarily have to involve whips and chains, black leather, or dungeon gear. Though if they find these props to help them get in the mood, there is no reason why Christians should not use them. There is nothing sinful about these items. In fact, they are part of the Christian heritage. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I beat my body and bring it into submission for fear that by any means that after I have preached to others, I myself should be rejected. Many S&M uh, &S devices, such as floggers, whips, clamps, chastity belts, and cat of nine tails, bear close resemblance to a wide array of devices early Christian penitents used to whip their bodies and mortify their flesh. They did this to submit their bodies to Christ, to emulate his suffering on the cross, and to purify themselves spiritually and attain, and attain a closer union with God. Many BDSM practitioners describe a feeling of spiritual union with their partners that transcends physical sexuality. It's 4 p.m., honey. Time for your oublette. <laughs> into the ca into the into the Christ cage. Yes, they're referring to subspace there, by the way. For those of you who are in the know on this terminology. Uh subspace is a term that refers to uh the sort of pleasurable 
generally pleasurable feeling of dissociation that submissives often get after particularly intense um usually after intense bdsm sessions it's a it's generally uh explained as sort of like a euphoric but a little bit dissociated um uh environment hey vermin good to see you yeah christ approved subspace everybody a lot of people like it yeah it's a good type of head fog i mean of course there are times where subspace can be a little bit difficult but yeah loving bondage and discipline Bondage and discipline are a part of the spiritual tradition of Christianity and are reflected in how a loving, all-knowing God guides his followers and instructs them in his will. If people are bound with chains and trapped by the cords of affliction, affliction, God tells them what they have done and how arrogantly they have transgressed. He opens their ears to correction and insists they rep repent from iniquity. Excuse me. If they serve him obediently, they will end their days in prosperity and their years in happiness. As God looks after us in Christian BDSM, the husband looks after his wife and spiritual growth and her physical needs, and the wife submits to her husband for guidance and fulfillment. For these reasons, the husband may find it appropriate to discipline her as needed in a spirit of love. He disciplines her as God disciplines all of us believers, and as, and as we read in Hebrews, this may smart at the time, but it's always for our good, for our own good. Okay, guys, guys, guys. Thank goodness. Of course, we are not endorsing any sort of abuse or non-consensual violence. BDSM is not wife beating or domestic violence. There is a huge difference between punishment inflicted out of anger and cruelty by one person overpowering another and discipline that is meted out with love and reason, gratefully and willingly received. That is true. There are great differences between that. But notice that they're starting to fudge the lines here. Do you notice that as they go through this, the lines between what God is telling you to do and what is supposed to be and what is um, consensual. Interestingly, I will note, I think it's very important to note here because uh, I do have a lot of issues with this, but I will note that keep in mind that up here, they said that the ideal marriage is a submissive wife. And down here, they're saying that, oh, well, it's gotta be, it's gotta be consensual, but they're not advocating non-consensual violence, but God wants you to be a submissive wife. So, there's some issues here, isn't there? On one hand, they're literally telling you that, the, that God's ideal is for a wife to be brought into submission, even if it requires discipline. And then on the other hand, they're saying, well, not non-consensually, but you know, God won't like it if you don't do it. So... Very, 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 very smeared environment here that I think is really not good. Those who participate in bondage and discipline and sadomasochism do so of their own free will and by mutual agreement. And as with the dominant submissive relationship, it takes two to tango. Although it may seem like the person who ties the knots or wields the paddle holds all the power, if BDSM is practiced respectfully and ethically, the power is shared. The husband should always respect the limits of his wife with respect to pain or humiliation so he does not inflict any real physical or emotional harm on her. And here's where we're going to get into the doozy. Can a man be submissive to his wife? This is a tricky question, but a very important one that needs to be addressed. We believe that a man can adopt a submissive and servile role and allow his wife to dominate him sexually if it is absolutely clear that outside of the bedroom, the husband is the spiritual head of the marriage. Just as a woman gives the gift of submission to her husband, there is no reason why for their mutual sexual gratification, a man should not be able to submit his body to his wife for her use and to serve her sexually. This is totally in alignment with the biblical command that the husband and wife give each other due benevolence her body is meant for his sexual enjoyment and vice versa however this reversal of roles in the co is in the context of sexual relations is only possible due to the sanctity of the marriage bed an explicit understanding on the parts of both the husband and the wife that they will adopt their natural roles in the rest of their daily lives we would counsel against couples living the wife dominant and husband submissive roles 24 7 as this could lead to spiritual confusion yeah, all the fun goes out of it, doesn't it? It was fun while they were talking about the fist of God spiritually awakening you via orgasm, and then the Christian bullshit crawls back in. And then they go, yeah, husbands are not allowed, boys are not allowed to be submissive. And, I mean, you can, but only if you dominate your wife the rest of your life. It's, it's, okay. 
before uh <laughs> okay guys uh christian bdsm uh i'm gonna give this a zero out of ten for how to build a healthy bdsm relationship just so you know, there are all kinds of intense things that you can get up to with BDSM relationships. And one of the key things about BDSM is that it has, that it should be. Well, okay, let me reword that. One of the things about BDSM relationships is that they're relationships. While there is room for casual forms of BDSM, um, the the thing about that makes BDSM work is that there's mutual trust and there are there are there is discussion and there is a building of a relationship over time. It's not just uh, a contract or following the manual. It's a thing that has to be worked out between individuals who come to trust one another and know each other. Um. So, you know, it's kind of important to uh, it's kind of important to keep that in mind. Um. And also, I just want to point out how much toxicity is actually dripping in this with regard to the smearing, again, the, the, the blurring of lines between what God wants you to do and what is is uh, is uh, practiced in sex. Just so you guys know, let me tell you a quick story. This is not a sexy story at all. This is not an interesting story. When I was younger, my uh, my parents constantly fought specifically about this verse wives submit to your own husbands as to the lord for the husband is the head of the wife as is also christ the head of the church so that uh so wives so wives should submit to their husbands in everything my stepdad and mom would fight about this whenever there was a disagreement between them it would always come back to this because basically my stepdad would always say, well, you're supposed to submit to me. You're supposed to listen to me. And if my mom didn't do that, well, there comes the Bible verse again. Thought we were supposed to be Christians. Yeah, see, Lady Hopium's saying that as well. My dad would pull that verse on my mom as well. Yeah, it's gross, isn't it? And this is why I, this is why this particular article bothers me so much. This article bothers me because I know damn well how Christians treat that verse. And what they mean is that, yes, women need to submit in everything. They say do benevolence. They say that it's an equal relationship, but they also explicitly say that it's not an equal relationship and that a wife should submit to her husband in everything. It's very fucked up. Oh, there's a crazy amount, the kid. There's a crazy amount in Christian in Christian groups. Christians, there are a unironically large amount of Christians who do not believe that you can violate your wife's consent because she's your property, because she made a vow to you. I'm not kidding you. That is a incredibly common belief among uh, Christians. Dennis Prager wrote about that. Dennis Prager currently has an article still up about that. It's very, very bad. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, it's still up. Of course it is. Yeah, I could probably look it up right now. Hold on, let's see. Here you go. It's right here. Dennis Prager Show, When a Woman Isn't in the Mood, Part 1. There's two articles about this. When a Woman Isn't in the Mood... Uh, the answer is she should get over it. That's what he says. That's what Dennis Prager's argument is, that she should just get over it. She needs to serve her husband. And I'm pretty sure he pulls on that quote during this article. Actually, let's see. I wonder. Let's just see out of curiosity if he does. Okay, he doesn't quote it. Damn. Damn. He's Jewish and that's a New Testament quote. Yeah, but Dennis Prager quotes the Bible all the time, even though he's Jewish. He does that all the time anyway. So do you feel educated? Do you feel Christian edutained, everybody? Oh, Christian marriages are absolutely upholding rape culture. Just woke up again and now we're on, Den on uh, Dennis Prager. Dennis Prager's a fuck. But yes, it's absolutely true that Christian marriages uphold rape culture. In fact, um, Christian marriages are... Uh, they are so politically fucked. Christian marriage is all about uh, affirming 
patriarchy. It's all about affirming, I mean, monarchy, honestly. The uh the Christian the Christian marriage is designed to break families down into the smallest possible units so that they can be most easily controlled. That is why the Christian marriage developed into being a wife, uh, a, a husband, wife, and two kids. That is the way that they wanted to go. They want to break society down into the most patriarchally, hierarchically controlled things. Because if, if you build families around the husband, and the church is also built around men, because it is, Christianity is super patriarchal so the church is built around men men can become kings and men's are and all men are the king of their household well that's a really easy way to keep people controlled you can very easily say uh that wife is out of line that kid is out of line we can disown them and you're alone you're scared to de defy the family you're scared to defy the church you're scared to defy the state and the religion, the family, the state, they're all mixed together. They're all entangled intentionally, so you can't do anything, so that you're controlled. <sighs> oh yeah, and also, all of this shit that we've been talking about directly overlaps with the way that Christians view children as property as well. Sound Judgment says, It's a complicated narrative to retell, but the history of authoritarian Christianity as the dominant religion in Europe has had extremely far-reaching implications in basically every area of life for anyone in a place ex affected by a colonial expansion from Europe. So damn near everywhere. Yes, thank you. Sound Judgment brings up an excellent point, which is that, remember, that when I said earlier that Christianity, fundamentalist Christianity, is an imperial religion, that most of Christianity is an imperial religion, I mean that. They teach each other to go out into the world, to remove other religions, to defeat heathens, to drive out heathens, and there's varying degrees of it. You know, Catholics are pretty hardcore about that sort of thing, you know? Um, uh, evangelical fundamentalists, pretty hardcore about that thing. But this language is in even the super, super progressive, um, you know, Christian churches still talk about a lot of this stuff in the same way, which is really unfortunate. And what that means is that throughout, I mean, colonialism was a church project. Colonialism was fueled by the Christian church. It's so fucked up. Nut says, as a dude, I know that a lot of guys uh, that are he that hear people say, uh, saying more guys should be independent, and they interpret that as all men should be bottoms. I thought this for a minute, and I'm glad I got over it. Yeah, that's really silly. That doesn't mean that, yeah, that's really silly. You, just because you like getting pegged doesn't mean you're permanently a bottom forever. That's so silly. Colonialism was a function of the church consolidating. Of course it was. The church was able to finance conquests and gather worldwide money and income. You know that churches, okay, guys, churches like missionaries would go overseas they would establish a church, they would get native followers from that place, they would convert them to Christianity, and those native followers would pay tithes. They would give money, tribute to the church, which would then get sent overseas. The church got itself powerful and rich by exporting, by playing religious imperialism. And of course the Crusades, we don't even need we can we can get really into the Crusades, but colonialism was another form of this. Residential schools, another form of this. And notice how frequently the state aligns with the church. Isn't that interesting? Now, nowadays, it's a little more messy. When conservatives are in power, the church and the state may as well be the same fucking thing. When Democrats are in power, it's a little bit distanced, and there's a little bit of a slowdown. But still, in a lot of cases, Christians get what they want from even Democrats. Democrats still hang out with the, 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 what's it called? The, the, the prayer, American prayer breakfast. I always forget what it's fucking called. Yeah, it's pretty bad. The kid says, as someone who studies sex sociology, so much of sexuality is based on interpretations of gender and the dichotomy between masculine and feminine. The more secure you are in your gender expression and gender identity, the more open you often are to doing things in bed. That is absolutely true. Another, another way I mean, guys, I don't want to go, I don't want to sound like a total conspiracy theorist here, but I do think that it's really interesting how hung up people are about gender roles when gender roles, notice, gender roles, as we always argue about them, 
were invented by fucking Christianity. Christianity imposed the gender roles, the strict binary of feminine woman and masculine man, of dominant husband and and uh, submissive wife. These were built by Christianity. Other ex other versions have existed until Christianity took over the entire world. It's religious imperialism, and it affects even gender. I know your your brain is imploding. Oh. There's a really good Fundy Fridays on that. That sounds great. I mean, personally, my gender doesn't have much to do with my sexuality. Well, for individuals, it doesn't. But the way we talk about it in society, it does. Discordant Vol says the French would establish churches in some areas. The churches would then get attacked by the locals because they were often the precursor to colonization. So then the army would ju would justifiably go in to seize territory to protect the churches. Yep, the first wave of col of col of uh, col of colonization was religious colonization. Conservative men are always so insecure in their masculinity. It makes sense that they would be related to their sexual repression in some ways. Oh, it's it's ridiculous. You have never, you have not even seen masculine posturing until you've seen Christian masculine posturing, dude. Christian masculine posturing is so motherfucking toxic. These guys will literally get themselves killed trying to prove to one another and to God apparently who's the most masculine. It's outrageous. You wouldn't believe how many chairs I can carry. Breaks back. Watch this. I'll jump off the bleachers in the church thing and won't even break my legs. <laughs> the number of times I saw Christian dudes completely deck themselves because they were trying to be the most masculine, prove to God that they were the most masculine dude around. It's so fucking bad. Delia Cor says, you know what's an interesting thing? Non-binary as a category is unlike transgender or homosexuality in that it was not developed as a meta as a medicalized othering by a powerful institution. That's a really interesting point, and I'd love to talk about that even further in the future, which we will. Okay, that's true, Gayfesh. To be fair, yes. But that is that is sort of toxic Christian masculinity all wrapped up in the thing, you know? Sound Judgment says, being in the Bible Belt, I've seen it my whole life. Pastors wrestling each other in the front yard to show how tough and manly they are. Yeah, exactly. I really like that. I really like what you said, Delia Cor. That's a really good observation. Yeah, I think basically everyone, everyone who grew up in a in like a super Christian environment probably had a had a period like that, even if you were trans. Like, it's very hard for me to explain to people who didn't grow up in a in a Christian cult how extreme it was. The gender policing in those communities is insane. If you even, I would get made fun of because I didn't like, I didn't, I would like, uh, you know, I, I have ADHD and I don't know, maybe I'm autistic too, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, when I was younger, I would hate it if I got stuff on my hands, like it would make me feel very uncomfortable. And so I would hold my hands without my fingers touching because I didn't like the feeling of like, uh, of like dirt or sticky stuff or oil on my hands. I would just sort of hold my hands like this and I would get made fun of for being gay because I didn't like the feeling of shit all over my hands. I'm not kidding you. The gender policing is so insane, you can't even believe it. The kid says, oh, as a trans man, I got gender policed insanely for acting masculine. But then they were misogynistic and were mad creepy to 14-year-old me when I acted femme. Yeah, it's a fucking bitch. The way that they put, the way that they put trans people through the ringer in Christian environments is a bitch. It is horrible. Of course. That's another one, of course. Big Orange Jew says, the amount of unironic, closeted gay stuff that happens from Christian communities is wild. It's fucking crazy. Yep. There is, there is no fucking winning in those environments. You get fucked no matter which way you go. Anyway. Fucking impossible. You got girl police for cross- Oh my god! Oh my god, Bonks Daily. I'm not kidding you. My pastor, 
M the pastor that I've showed on this stream before, my pastor would would call out men in the front row if they were sitting with their legs crossed. He would make fun of them publicly if they sat with their legs crossed. I'm not kidding you. Literal same fucking hat. They were obsessed with that. Holy shit. Yep, Gayfesh says that sounds like cavalry. Calvary. Yeah, it is. It was fucking Calvary. So many Christian dudes would be considered queer coded if they were characters in a Disney film. Yup. The kid says, same for me. Having one leg folded over my other was, uh, would, would, they would be obsessed with it. They were so obsessed with it. For them, they thought that sitting cross legged meant that you were gay. Unironically. God, it's so fucking weird. I'm so glad I'm out of there. See, that's the thing. That's the thing. This is the this is the takeaway of the whole religious part, the religious half of this stream of us talking about all the religious shit. This is why we have to do better. This is why we can't just become fedora tipping liberals. We have to do better. Otherwise, these motherfuckers are going to take over.